let's start with some introductions. Um, first, thank you to all of our panelists for joining us during this lunch hour to talk um, about everything judicial internships and judicial clerkships with our students. Um, Professor Brescia, can we start with you? Um, you want to give us just a little bit about your clerking background? Sure, I'd be happy to, Dean Fitzpatrick. Uh, so uh, those of you who uh, don't know me, I'm Ray Brescia. I teach uh, here at Albany Law School. And I clerked, my, my path to clerking just really quickly was a little different than normal in the sense that I did not go right out of law school into clerking. I, I practiced for three years and then uh, clerked for a year for Constance Baker Motley, who, uh, uh, who at the time was a, a district judge in the Southern District of New York. Great, thank you very much. I think you're being a little bit um, humble about your background, but that's fine. We'll get it out of you as we go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brittany Bushman, a current 3L, can you tell us a little bit about um, your background and your 1L internship and where you're going after you graduate? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have a little bit of a unique background. Um, I didn't come right to law school out of undergrad. I had um, a bachelor's degree in family finance, which is a very unique degree. So I worked as a financial counselor for a couple of years prior to coming to law school and helped people you know, with debt and credit. And that kind of really stimulated my interest in bankruptcy, um, which is why I um, interned during my 1L summer um, at the Utah Bankruptcy Court for those I know a lot of people here, but those that don't know, I'm originally from Utah. I came here for law school. So um, I went back my 1L summer to not only you know hang out with my family, but to also intern at the Utah Bankruptcy Court there. And I was a, a floating intern with three out of the four bankruptcy judges there. And that really just stimulated my interest even more for the bankruptcy field. And now I will be clerking after I graduate with um, Judge Greg in the Grand Rapids, um, Michigan bankruptcy court. Awesome. Congratulations, Brittany. Thank you. Alicia, same question. I'd like to hear about judicial internship experiences and your post-grad plans. And, and just to let everybody know, Alicia graduated in December. Congratulations, Alicia. Thank you. Um, so yeah, my 1L summer, I interned for a federal judge in the Southern District of New York, um, Judge Annalisa Torres, and I truly loved the experience. Um, I've worked, I've interned for a judge in state court, New York State Court, like after high school and before law school, but this was a completely different experience for me as I was treated like a law clerk and I had to actually draft opinions and kind of come to conclusions um, based on what the law said for either side. So I truly enjoyed that experience. And it motivated me to really want to obtain a clerkship um, post-grad. So luckily, I was able to obtain two clerkships. So I am uh, I have an appellate clerkship in D.C. with the D.C. Court of Appeals, which is the equivalent of a state Supreme Court. And then after that, I'm doing a federal clerkship um, with Judge Robert Richardson in the District of Connecticut. And he's a federal magistrate. Fantastic. Thank you. Awesome. I, think it, I think it had more to do with your tenacity and your drive and your abilities than luck, but, but fantastic. Um, Allie then Stackelberg, same question. So, so a little bit of background, um, where you are now um, and what you did during law school. Um, so I'm with Judge D'Agostino here in the Northern District. Um, I've been with her for almost two years now. I started with her right after I graduated in uh, 2019. Um, so during law school, I was very much, I came in wanting to be a prosecutor and I still want to be a prosecutor, but on the excellent advice of my career counselor, Joanne, um, I applied for an internship in Judge D'Agostino's chambers for the summer after my second year. Um, I had heard a lot about clerkships during school and I come from a family of non-lawyers, so I had never heard of that job before. Um, and so I was kind of curious and Joanne encouraged me to apply and I did. And I spent the summer after my 2L year 
with Judge D'Agostino and had kind of a similar experience as Alicia where we drafted lots of opinions and we watched court and um, we kind of got into the workings of Judge D'Agostino's brain. And I was very interested in applying for clerkships after that internship. And I also was fortunate enough where she offered me a clerkship at the end of my internship that summer. So um, I had a little bit of a unique way to my clerkship as well. I don't think that's super common, but, um, and now I've been here for two years. So that's me. Nice. Thanks, Allie. Congratulations. And yeah, definitely not, not the most typical way into a clerkship. So um, a testament to your work to be asked to stay, I think. Um, so um, what, what we're hearing is that our panelists primarily are focused on federal internships with judges and postgraduate clerkships, but there are many other types of clerkships as well. So I'm going to turn to Professor Brescia and throw this at you. Um, first, you know, why a clerkship of any kind? And then can you talk to us a little bit about the differences between federal, state, and different levels within each. Yeah, so you know, two different questions, right? Like, so why a clerkship? I, I think there's there are a lot of reasons for uh, you know for for doing a clerkship. I think you know, number one is the experience is extraordinary, uh, particularly if you you know want to if you imagine yourself litigating at some point. Um, uh, whether as, as I did after I had already been litigating for a few years, um, but to really understand how courts work and most importantly, how judges think. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 you also really get to hone your writing. Um, and so those are, you know, those are sort of the uh, you know, the, the most important benefits, I think, of, uh, of clerking is uh, really spending that time to think about the law, to, you know, not worry about clients and, uh, you know, tasks. You're just researching and writing and researching and writing um, and, in, and in, in many ways sort of getting inside of how a judge thinks um, how, uh, you know, the, the types of things that judges weigh, uh, which is, you know, as an advocate then, um, you know, turning the tables, you become a better advocate, not just because your, your writing improves uh, incredibly, but you, you start to, to understand the things that judges think about and, you um, and, and how they look at problems, uh, which is what you're, as an advocate, what you're, what you're trying to get them to do is, is look at problems the way you see them. And so being able to frame your issues in ways that judges uh, will receive them in the ways you want them to receive them and then act in the way you want them to act, you've got to understand how they think and how they receive information. Um, so there's there really is no better uh, uh, way to understand that than to to sit you know with a judge and and talk through with him or her how they're looking at the problem. Um, so uh, so I think it's I think that there really are great things that you pick up uh, as a as a clerk. So I, I think it's a it's a great thing to try to do if you can do it. Now, uh, you've got a panel just you know, by uh, uh, happenstance that it, it are people mostly who are working in, in, uh, with federal judges, uh, although Alicia, I believe that that's, you know, uh, the, the appellate court is, is technically a, 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 akin to a state court, right? Um, so, so you are gonna be in the state system. And, and, and that's, you know, there are great, great opportunities in the state system. Um, the, the big difference is, uh, you know, the federal courts have a kind of rhythm to them and they have a calendar to them and they have a process for bringing in new clerks uh, for at every level. Uh, you know, uh, 
magistrate judges and bankruptcy judges and district court judges um, and you know appellate judges, you know there's a there's a cycle, there's a season mostly for uh, you know applying to to federal judges and they bring in new clerks, you know at, at a minimum, you know generally every two years or, or um, at a minimum every two years. Often it's it's a one year clerkship. I, I don't know what the percentage is these days. When I was a student, it was far more common for judges just to have clerks for one year. And so that means there are a lot more opportunities, right? Um, on the state side, uh, the trial judges in New York State tend to have uh, permanent clerks. Uh, and these are people who, uh, you know, work with the judge. That they, uh, you know, do everything that the that the that the uh, postgraduate clerks do. But they just they're with the judge for much longer. Often they're people who want to become judges themselves, which is another another reason. If you think someday you want to to maybe try to be a judge, being a clerk is a great experience. So that's another thing. If that's something you're thinking about. Uh, and if you want to teach someday, clerkship is a great thing to do as well. So, uh, you know, that being said, so in New York State, at least, the trial judges are much less likely to hire people right out of law school. That's not so in other states. So we've had some uh, luck, I believe, in Connecticut with trial court judges. I think they call that the superior court um, New Jersey, um, they do a lot of hiring. They tend to hire, as you would imagine, from Seton Hall and Rutgers, but the, the, the trial judges in state courts in New Jersey, uh, but there are opportunities there. There are just a few opportunities in the state court in the trial courts. Now, that being said, the appellate division and the court of appeals have, uh, appellate divisions and the court of appeals have a, a, high, a clerkship hiring process for people right out of law school. It's highly competitive, but those are great jobs, uh, and they're, they're, they look great on the resume in, uh, in New York State, as, as any clerkship does. Um, so I, I'll stop there. I, 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 Dean Fitzpatrick, was there, did I cover the sorts of things you wanted me to cover? Is there anything I missed? Perfect, perfect. Yes, thank you for that. It's a great overview. Um, so just building on something that Professor Brescia said, um, I want to turn to um, Brittany and Alicia, who have most recently been through this process. Okay, so I'll start with Brittany. Brittany, who's Oscar? <laughs> Why should I know about him? <laughs> Yeah, so Oscar is the is the website that you go on to um, find these types of positions. Although I will say I did not just utilize Oscar. I utilized a lot of different methods to apply to clerkships. But Oscar is the primary resource. Um, and there is like a hiring plan that was alluded to by Professor Brescia. Um, and Oscar utilizes this. So you can't actually create an account until your spring semester of 2L year, um, and then you can start looking at positions and applying. I joined my, my, that, that semester, and I also um, utilized the judiciary website and just looked at the positions listed there um, for clerkships. Um, I actually looked pr prior to this um, presentation to see if there are clerks, like positions listed, um, and there's numerous law clerks listed on the judiciary's website, and I found the, tr the, the more confusing aspect was some judges use Oscar and some don't. And so, um, for instance, I used to live in Seattle, outside of Seattle when I was younger, and I was looking at some uh, judicial clerkships in that area as well, and they don't use Oscar. Um, and I kind of could tell that by looking in the Oscar system, and they have all of the year prior clerkships that have been filled. Like you can look in the search like terms to see like which judges have been available in certain areas before. And I didn't see any Washington or Oregon ju um, judges, um, at least in the bankruptcy realm, because um, that was primarily my focus. Um, and so I not only looked at Oscar and the judiciary website, but I also mailed my applications personally to each judge that I wanted to apply to. So that was a little bit about the process that I took. Um, but yeah, Oscar is the number one um, place to look um, and Alicia can obviously jump in 
if she wants to about Oscar, but that's the, that's the, the number one source to look first. The primary source, and, and I should be clear when we're talking about federal judicial internships, I'm sorry, clerkships, right? Okay, Alicia, what would you like to that? Um, I think that my process is very similar to Brittany's. I mean, the day that Oscar opened for two was the day I registered, like, <laughs> um, and I think that I utilized Oscar as much as I could before the actual date of submission, um, which was like June 15th, I believe. Um, and I also did the same thing. I used the US Gov, I used the USA Gov's website and the judiciary website. And I also went to like individual courts websites because if you look at the judges profiles, sometimes they'll have like a, their clerkship hiring plan for each individual judge. I know that SDNY judges do that a lot. Um, so I, I mean, like it's, it's a lot of research that goes into finding these positions. <laughs> um, I specifically also, I was looking at um, finding like an African-American judge. So there's a, I looked at a separate website that listed all of the um, article three African-American judges and like clicked on their profiles and then researched them to see if I could find like their clerkship hiring plans um, and where they're located throughout the country. Uh, I knew that I wanted to do a federal clerkship. So that's primarily where I um, did most of my research because I knew that those filled before state ones did um, because state was more so in the fall. Um, but yeah, so I, it's a lot of research and a lot of time went into the, this. <laughs> right, yeah. And so that, that's a great point. So just for everybody on the call, the Oscar, O-S-C-A-R website opened up for two L's on February 3rd of this year. So it is open for you to create a profile. Um, so Ali, I'm gonna skip over to you for a second. Um, who, you are now probably in the position of, of seeing interns come into Judge D'Agostino's chambers. And so um, just to get a feel, how many of our students are going to be interning with a judge this summer? Just curious. Um, so this summer we have a bit of an overload. Usually she likes to keep it at um, three to four and we're going to have five this summer. Um, so that's a very big number. Um, I know Elise is on the call and she's one of our interns this spring. So we have three interns, usually three interns per semester and four or so during the summer. And so in terms of internships, can you give us an idea of what helps a candidate stand out and, and what of those characteristics do you think also might make a clerkship application stand out? Sure, so um, I think obviously there are uh, the kind of base ones where you need to do relatively well in school. I know um, a lot of judges and um, clerks who are involved in the hiring process for interns look first at your resumes and your cover letters and I know it seems a little bit ridiculous, but one of the things we look for is whether there are any typos in your cover letter. Um, not because it's, I mean, it's not really important, but it just shows, you know, are you proofreading and doing the things that we do every single day? Um, so that's kind of a base level sort of thing that you should make sure you're, you're giving time to. Um, we also, I know I value, and the judge has mentioned that she values people who are able to learn from their experiences. Um, so a lot of what we do in our chambers, it's very collaborative. So there is a lot of constructive criticism and feedback at all levels of your work and you do a lot of work. Um, so you receive a lot of feedback. So one of the things that's most important for us is having demonstrated your ability to kind of learn from either mistakes that you've made or things that you haven't done particularly well on um, and being able to talk about, you know, your ability to take feedback and constructive criticism. Um, in my interview for my internship with Judge Agostino, I had gotten a B in my lawyering class my first semester, and she asked me what that was about. Um, and that was probably one of the most terrifying interview questions I've ever gotten. Um, so I had to explain to her, you know, yes, I, I got a B, but this is what I did going forward. I met with my professor that you know, next semester, I did this, I did that, and my grade has improved significantly. And that's the kind of thing that, to be able to say that, you know, you've stumbled a little bit, um, but that you're, you're learning and that you're growing is something that I know we value in our chambers. That's really helpful. Um, 
Do you have an opinion on letters of recommendation? I know students often ask us, who should I ask for letters of recommendation? And I would just, I'll open this to the whole panel. I mean, just people that know you. I mean, we see a lot of pretty letters of recommendations start to look the same. Um, so anybody who really knows you as a person and knows your work and can speak to that, I think would be a good um, recommendation. Um, I just wanted to add that I forgot to mention another area that I found a clerkship was um, I did just the beginning um, share the wealth clerkship program, which is actually geared towards uh, minority law students finding clerkships. So that's another source um, for minority students to look for clerkships and they uh, do a, a panel interviewing with different uh, judges um, in different areas. But um, just to answer your question for uh, recommendations, um, well, Russia did one of my recommendations. <laughs> so I'm very happy for that. And I chose, basically, I chose my 1L professors who I um, did really well in their class and also I TA'd for or who wrote my, or who uh, was my advisor for my note and comment. So I chose like Russia, Chong, and Redwood. And basically you should always choose someone who can really write about, who can write about your writing um, to show the judges that, you know, you are a good writer other than outside of them reading your writing sample, um, hearing it from someone else's um, recommendation is also very important. And like during my interview, the judges have said like, you have really great recommendations, like you're, they're glowing. So I'm really appreciative of my professors who did write those recommendations. Um, Cause I do think that it made a difference and it definitely made me stand out as a candidate. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll, I'll jump off on that. You know, ab absolutely, yes. It was a glowing letter of recommendation for you, Alicia, and it was well-deserved. Um, so uh, I think letters of recommendation make a big difference um, and uh, can help you stand out. Uh, I think that something, uh, as Alicia says, you know, if you were a TA for somebody, um, for me, one of my letters was from, you know, I ended up clerking for Judge Motley uh, one of my recommendations was from someone who had clerked for her before, uh, someone, someone who wrote letters for other judges as well, uh, because I was close with him uh, and he was, you know, he knew my work. Um, but that, you know, absolutely was the thing that that put me over the top is that she, you know, she trusted him and, and that made a, a big difference. She was you know, at the time I clerked for her, she was very senior, uh, you know, she'd been a judge for, for many years. She didn't spend a lot of time on, on, on the clerkship process. You know, if she got uh, uh, recommendations from people who she trusted, she was like, okay, you know, that's good. And, and my interview was, I sat in, at, at her, her desk for 30 minutes while she spoke to me. I don't think I said more than, more than uh, you know, good morning judge and, and very nice to meet you at the end, you know. Uh, so my, that process was very different from, from a, a lot of other people's processes, but the main thing for me was that letter. And so uh, being thoughtful about, about that letter um, and, you know, ask your recommender, so, so it should be someone who knows you well um, and, you know, really, you know, be willing to uh, give, you know, someone you want to write for you, um, you know, doesn't know you that well, you know, they're not going to be able to write anything more than a cookie cutter letter, you know, if, if you know, you got a good grade, but, you know, you never spoke up in class, uh, you know, just start talking about professors, you know, you got a good grade, but you never spoke up in class, you never went to office hours, and you expect that professor to write more than a paragraph. Yeah, you know, their, their final was great, you know, what more can I say? That's not going to be a terrific letter of recommendation. So you should, you know, work with people who know you. Um, another great source for judges of uh, letters or other judges. So if you're able to do an internship, a field placement with a judge, that makes a huge difference. I assume, Alicia, one of your letters, uh, either either a letter from the judge for whom you clerked. Uh, uh, or even a phone call, right? Uh, if, if, you know, you're working for a, a judge, 
if you're interning for a judge, even them making just a phone call can make a huge difference and, and put a little gold star on your application. But the bottom line is, you know, it, what's more important is, is having people write letters for you who know you, who are familiar with your work, uh, and not just, you know, the bright, shiny object, um, you know, someone who can, who you got a good grade for. I think in addition to that, like using them as a reference. So I, um, like I took a class with Judge Stewart and we hit it off and Judge Stewart, um, I asked him to be a reference. So he was actually on my cover letter as a reference. Um, and he, when I told him my list of judges, he literally was like, who do I know? Who can I call? And it came up in my interview with Judge Rod, uh, Richardson. He said, oh, you know, Judge Stewart, like we went to baby magistrate school together. So I think that that also makes a difference. So if you, even if you take a class with a judge and ask them to be a reference um, for, on your application, that can make a difference as well. Great. Brittany, do you have anything to add to that? Um, just to echo what everyone else is saying, um, my recommendations um, were all professors. Um, I chose um, Professor Toronto that I'm now TAing for for my second year, so I had a really, really close relationship with her. And I chose a 1L professor, Professor Chung. Um, well, I had her in second year too for biz orgs, um, but I always was in her office, so she knew who I was. And then Professor Lynch, um, because I wrote a paper for her for one of her classes, and she uh, I met with her multiple times and she recommended I try and publish it even. So she knew my writing style and um, I'll echo what Alicia said too. Um, some of the judges also required not only letters of recommendation, but references. And so because I um, was applying primarily in the bankruptcy, uh, you know, for bankruptcy judges, I put, you know, the attorney that, that teaches um, bankruptcy law here at Albany Law, I put her down as a reference. So just echoing what everyone else was, everyone else said it more in great terms than I did. <laughs> uh, I want to just jump on that a little bit, Brittany. Uh, we had a few years ago, a panel of bankruptcy judges come up uh, to speak at the law school. And, you know, I, I would really, you know, look at clerking for bankruptcy judges as a real opportunity, uh, often overlooked opportunity. Uh, as, as long as you've taken the bankruptcy course uh, and did well in it and, and found it interesting, uh, it's going to be a super important area of law over the next few years. It always is a very important and, and quite unique aspect of American law, in fact. Um, but it's, it's a great opportunity, and, and it, is, it, it is an area of, of clerking that many people um, overlook, number one, many students, many applicants overlook, number one, and number two, bankruptcy judges aren't necessarily looking for you know, the highest pedigree uh, or the, or the you know, um, people getting straight A's. They wanna see that you care about the issue, that you're knowledgeable about bankruptcy, uh, taken a class and done well in it, uh, maybe worked at a legal aid organization and worked on bankruptcy cases. So that's it's actually the way it's supposed to work, uh, it, where you know judges want to see people actually know the material that they're um, you know that they have to uh, come across because it's very complex. Um, but you know that's where you know there's a there's a bit of uh, an opportunity for. Uh, for students um, that that others uh, you know might might otherwise overlook, so it's something to and it's a I think it's a great um, a great experience and looks great on the resume. I'll, I'll just say that the the other thing that Brittany was pretty excellent about and um, Alicia as well is exploring geographically uh, opportunities, right? So because clerkships um, are such a wonderful experience, it's really important to stay open in terms of geography and willingness to um, do go where go where they lead you. Um, I have a question I see from Caroline Rodriguez, Rodriguez and, and I wanna offer anyone who wants to, to ask a question, please just raise your hand or unmute. Caroline? Um, so Brittany and Alicia, you guys both spoke about getting references from professors and it seems like you only got references from professors. I was wondering if you considered um, asking people who you had interned with during summers, or during the school year, other lawyers, and if you decided, if you did consider them and didn't decide to pick them, how come you did that? 
Sure, um, I'll jump in. Um, so my 1L year, as I mentioned, I interned for the bankruptcy judges in the Utah Bankruptcy Court. And I actually relied on letters of recommendation from them already. Um, I was nominated for a bankruptcy award through the American College of Bankruptcy. And so to make that application stand out, I um, asked for the recommendations from those judges. So I didn't um, I didn't really want to ask for a second one. I felt that was a little awkward um, to ask for another one. And so I really just relied on my professors. And following my 2L year, which was last summer, um, I did have um, an internship lined up with the attorney that teaches bankruptcy law. I had worked out and an, an, an paid internship at her office. Um, but bankruptcy really bottomed out and it is still in a sense bottomed out right now because of all of the pandemic protections you know the stimulus funds there's protections against evictions and foreclosures and so i didn't work last summer um and i um i did have a field placement um and i i didn't work as closely in that position because the pandemic hit right in the middle of it and so i really was just doing um, various research projects and didn't really have a hands-on experience in the office and so i didn't feel that they would have as much to say as a professor that's worked as more closely with me over the years than in that small position so that's kind of why i chose just professors Um, I think mine was pretty similar. I think that I didn't want to ask because I, I entered in the SDNY, but I didn't want to ask her specifically for a recommendation because I know that not all judges do that. Um, so I, and I really wanted to focus on my professors who I thought would be able to talk about um, because of all of my professors I've had for like a year or like known them for a year. So I just thought they could talk about my personality better and just my writing and overall um, skills better. And then I did intern, and also by the time I like did my applications, I needed to, they were like in the spring, I started them. So I kind of like couldn't use a 2L reference or anything. Like it was really just my 1L, that first year relationships that I developed that I thought were more important. Great. Uh, Allison, I see you have your hand raised. I have a question kind of going off that. Um, kind of two prongs. One is kind of tailored to the one L's. And I'm wondering, I definitely have noticed, like I've built relationships with professors and kind of going off of what Brittany said that she was always in Professor Chung's office and built a close relationship with her. I'm wondering maybe if Professor Brescia could answer this, if you've noticed maybe this year, particularly if like, are you still able to build those relationships in the same way that you have in prior years, like with the one L's who aren't there in person or does that pose any problems, I guess, like going forward and, and how we should be asking for um, letters? Well, I see some of my first year students uh, here, Alice, yes, uh, er Erica from last year. I, I think, I mean, to be honest, I, I don't have the same relationships with my first years from this year, uh, no question. Uh, but, you know, we make do. And so I think that the, you know, you, you can try to set up Zoom uh, meetings or, or meet after class when, this, when the faculty member is, is there in person. Um, but this too shall pass. You know, I think that, you, you know, um, trying to TA, you know, putting your hat in the ring to TA in the second year. Uh, trying to, to you know, take part in office hours when we can, uh, but there's no question that, that this year was, was a tough year uh, in so many ways, um, but you can still develop those relationships and, and, you know, nothing is set in stone, right? Like if, you, if you're looking, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, uh, really, but, you know, for the, the federal clerkships, I mean, it's getting earlier and earlier every year. I, 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 Dean Fitzpatrick, correct me if I'm wrong. I think, you know, people start thinking about this stuff in the spring of their second year uh, and, and the openings start to, you know, you start to get your applications in uh, for federal uh, positions uh, then. But then for the, the, the New York courts, it's in the, the, the fall of your third year, very early in the fall, but still the fall of the third year. So um, you can, um, 
you, know, you can develop, you have time to develop those relationships. If, if you know, it's, it all is not lost if you don't have a, a, a wonderful uh, relationship with a professor from your first year. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I think more often than not, um, the, the letters I write for clerkships, they tend to be people who have either been a research assistant for me or a teaching assistant or both. Um, so uh, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much if you're uh, you know if you're first year now and you haven't been able to to really develop those relationships with your uh, your first year professors thinking you know a year or year and a half ahead oh I'm I'm not going to have great letters like no don't worry about that um, you'll you'll still be able to to get uh, good letters from from your professors you'll still be able to to develop those relationships. I just kind of wanted to jump off that as well. Like I was very much a wallflower in my first year. And before I realized that that was a detriment, it was kind of too late. Um, so I was never the kind to show up in office hours. I was terrified of office hours. Um, and I wasn't, you know, a TA after my first year. And it's still possible at that point. You know, I would recommend that you get really into your field placements because your field placements and other clinics at the law school are an opportunity for you to shine in a way that isn't sometimes kind of so dependent on your performance your first year. So if you're one of those people where you're not locked into a TA position or you didn't show up at office hours, don't despair just yet. You have plenty of time to get involved with other programs at the law school. And, um, you know, Professor Brescia mentioned research assistant positions. Those are generally, you know, a little bit more open to more than just the people who did really well in their first year in those classes. So take advantage of those and, and take advantage of the networks that you have as well. Like I never thought that I had a good network and I just kind of stumbled into this really, really awesome network with the you know career counselors at the law school and the professors. And so it, even if you don't have you know really close relationships with your first year professors, it's, it's not like you're far from this. You have plenty of time to develop those relationships and you have other avenues that you can explore as well. I totally agree. And, uh, you know, don't, don't hesitate. You know, if you, if you really, uh, you know, want to create a relationship with a professor, you like their teaching style, you're interested in the, in the material that they, that they, uh, that they teach, that you, you've looked at their scholarship, it's of interest to you, you don't have to wait for a posting to go up at the career center for a research assistant position. You can reach out to any professor you want and say, you know, if you ever have a need for a research assistant, even a few hours a week, even a few hours a semester, I really, you know, would, would love to, to, to do that with you if that was something that of interest to, that was of interest to you. Uh, every faculty member has a research assistant budget and um, you know, uh, Ryan is currently my, one of my research assistants. Uh, so you know, don't wait for that posting. You know, sometimes professors have needs and like, ah, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't have time to to put a posting up, and they and they might find uh, you know uh, uh, some some work for you, and then you can start to develop that relationship. So don't no one you know you, no one's gonna you know be offended or think it's too forward. If you said like, I really like your work, I really like your teaching style, I really like the subject matter you teach, it's like, oh, tell me more, you know. Uh, and I'd love to, you know, if you had an opportunity, I, I'd love to to do some some work uh, uh, for you. Like, go for it. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no, but they'll file that. You know, if they don't have anything at the moment, they'll file that in the background. So you know, maybe not you know, this semester, but I'll definitely keep it in mind for next semester. You know, don't, don't hesitate to, to take that initiative. Great, excellent advice. So, so um, what about writing samples? And Ali, I'm gonna start with you because this is a question that we get a lot as students are preparing their application materials. What writing samples do you think Judge D'Agostino wants to receive or, or prefers to receive? Um, anything that you think reflects your work in the most kind of unedited fashion. So sometimes people will submit 
things that have gone through multiple rounds of edits. And that's usually like a note or, or a comment or something like that. And those can be great. And I, I actually use my note and comment as my writing sample because my first memo one all year was garbage. And so I didn't want to send it to anybody. Um, but anything that you think represents work that is good without a significant amount of editing. So um, that's just another plug for being you know, a research assistant because those might give you an opportunity to do some sort of um, writing sample type things as well. And also in your internships and field placements. I know a lot of people look for, they specifically come to us at you know, Judge Agostino's chambers and they tell us that one of their goals for the semester is to get something that they can use as a writing sample. And we love that, we encourage that. So um, something that you think reflects you know, the quality of your work, but that hasn't been overly edited by somebody else. Okay. I, you know, I couldn't agree more. And every internship, you know, even if it's a few hours a week, you know, some of the folks, some of whom are uh, on this call, uh, you know, worked on the COVID response core. You know, if you, 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 you any internship you, you, you do, any volunteer work you do, try and look out for opportunities for a nice 10 to 15 page research memo, uh, can't have any confidential information, you know, client confidential information in it. Uh, if you're working for a judge, you clear it with the judge. Some judges get prickly. If, uh, you know, students hold out, you know, work of chambers as their own, so you want to make sure, you know, with whatever placement you're in, that you're saying, oh, is it okay if I use this as a as a as a um, writing sample? Uh, but you know, you you go into it, go into your internship, saying I'm going to keep my eye out for that nice 10 to 15 page uh, research memo that will be that will represent my work, that will be interesting, and that will be really well done. Uh, and then it's got to be perfect in terms of, you know, grammatically and typos and, and, and all of that stuff, because you, because that's, that's, as, as Ali said at the very beginning, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you have to be perfect when working in chambers. Uh, and if you, if there are any mistakes, it's not going to look good. Uh, but, but also, you know, it can't be, oh yeah, I, I the, for, uh, this, this is the, this is the opinion that the, that the, the court issued, and I I wrote the first draft, and it's it bears no relation to what I actually wrote. But here's here's the court's opinion. Like, no, it's got to be your work, and it can't be heavily edited either. Alicia, what did you use when you applied? Um, I use um, a opinion that I wrote for Judge Torres, um, and. I actually, I had two writing samples, like just in case a longer one and a shorter one. Both of them were opinions that I wrote for Judge Torres. Um, and these were like the finalized drafts that I submitted to the law clerk. So they weren't edited by any of the law clerks. Um, it was purely just my own writing and the best that I could do at that time. Um, and I had like Professor Brescia just look over it just to see if there was any glaring mistakes. But other than that, like it was like my own work product. Great. Brilliant. And there were no glaring mistakes. I, I can I can honestly report. But that's right. That's you know if you if you're in a place where you know you're working on a portion of a brief, it 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 shouldn't be the final version that the lawyer submits where you know he or she you know edited your work and incorporated it into the brief. It should be your version and you and where the where you did you know, the lion's share, if not all of the work. And, you know, you can put a little asterisk footnote at the beginning and say, you know, this is a draft that was, you know, incorporated subsequently into a brief, but this work was exclusively my own. Like that, that that's completely appropriate. And, and um, you know, saying, oh, it's not the finished product. It's not what went into the brief ultimately. Well, they don't want that. They don't want to see the, the, the version that got worked over and was uh, heavily edited by your supervisor. That's not, that doesn't show your work. Um, it, I, I would just wanna add one thing to what Professor Brescia said, which is um, either by using the asterisk or creating a cover page to be sure to indicate that you, it's your work and also you've received permission from whomever your, you know, your supervisor, supervisor was. Brittany, were you gonna add something to that? 
Oh, I, I just know you were going to ask me what I used. And so I, I was, was just going to jump in. <laughs> I, I had two writing samples because some judges requested two. Um, but the one that I primarily used, if they only requested one, um, was the brief that my section of the brief that I wrote for the Gabrielli competition. Um, I, me and my partner won best brief in that competition. So I felt like that was the best opportunity, um, the best writing sample to use. And my second one actually was just um, the appeals brief from 1L lawyering, because um, I, I did fairly well on that particular brief. And so I had those two um, that I used for my writing sample. Great, thank you. Jess, I see you have your hand up. I was just wondering if judges tend to, or if you've noticed a preference for opinions versus memos versus a part of your note or a part of a brief from Gabriele, like, is there a preference or an order of preference? Um, so I've done, I've attended a lot of clerkship informationals throughout my time, like, and I was, it alluded to me that um, judges perf did not necessarily want note and comments because they wanted something that showed analysis. And so, and that was usually more so seen in um, an opinion or seen in a memo where you have a problem and you're applying the law because um, it shows your thought process. So that's, from my opinion, that's what it shows that they prefer. I echo that. Um, I, I received similar advice to try and avoid the note and comment. Um, if you have other um, papers. Um, but I mean, you know, Ali used her note and comment for her writing sample. So I don't think it's a determining factor necessarily, um, especially if you do have a, a long analysis part in your you note know, and comment, depending on what you're writing. But I tried to avoid that um, and used other things that I had written. Yeah, I would say my note and comment was like statutory analysis. So it was a very, you know, analysis heavy uh, note and comment. So I would, I would agree, you know, with both Alicia and Brittany, anything that has significant analysis on your part, I think, you know, would be fine. Great. So um, be before we move on to talking about interviews, um, I would love to know if anybody has any questions because I don't. I, I have to end exactly at one o'clock, and I don't want questions to go unanswered. Any student questions, Graham? I see your hand. Yes, thank you. Well, this has all been really great information. Is that timeline that Professor Pro Professor Brescia laid out? Is that the typical timeline? Yes, it it is, um, and actually. One of the reasons why we were intentional about having um, federal judicial clerks on this panel is because now is really the time to begin to thinking about as a 2L in your spring semester, um, to think about those applications, to think about who your recommenders might be, to create your Oscar profile, to polish up your writing sample um, because those applications will be released to judges through Oscar in June. So that's the first line of offense. Then um, the following timeline is in July, August is when our Court of Appeals will begin to accept applications for their central staff positions. And we are hopeful that they will accept applications and move forward with those in, in the next year. Um, and also the third and fourth department. So if you're a 2L, July and August of this year is when those will begin being posted through our on-campus recruiting process. Um, and of course the postings also exist on those court websites. Additionally, um, as Professor Brescia mentioned, the trial courts, New Jersey, Connecticut, Vermont, all terrific opportunities, particularly if you're at all worried about credentials. Um, a lot of those opportunities are available even if you know you, you don't have law review or, or you're not in the top 10%, right? Which often can be uh, requirements for federal judicial internships. So I encourage you all to think about those as well. Um, what we've done is we've created a cheat sheet so we're gonna send that out to your entire 2L class, if you're a 2L, 
um, because that is that's the audience for this timeline, and we'll send it out along with this video recording. I would just add as well, um, you know, more and more I'm hearing from judges, you know, Judge D'Agostino and other judges as well, that there's more of a preference these days. Am I echoing? Sorry. Um, there's more of a preference these days for people to have some experience before they come to clerk. So if you don't get a clerkship right out of law school, if you have the flexibility to continue to apply, you, you should do so. I mean, we have had clerks in our chambers who you know, we'll send an update year after year saying, you know, I'm still available and I'm still interested in applying. Here's my updated resume. And clerks get hired that way, you know, if they if they keep submitting their application. So if you end up working for a law firm, a lot of times those are relatively flexible in terms of letting you go to a clerkship for a year and then come back. They, they really like that. So if you don't get them right out of law school, don't freak out just yet. Um, some people don't have the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, but if you do, continue to apply. Any other questions? Okay. So um, interviewing. Alicia, I'm going to start with you. What? Tell me a little bit about that process and, and what's your best advice for students? Um, so I did, I did, um, I did panel interviews and I also did single interviews. Um, I think that I prepared by using career services. I did, Joanne set me up, um, with some other judges to do a panel interview, um, which was great. Um, it's very nervous. I mean, I was like nervous because I knew that I wanted this and I knew that I, um, was qualified to do it because I feel at the point that they ask you for an interview, they feel like you're qualified. So it's just about whether or not it's a personality match for chambers. And, um, but asking, but having like five judges ask me questions was terrifying and trying to figure out what I liked about each of them was also very terrifying. Um, but luckily I got through it. I think that at that point you just have to do a lot of the research and you know the questions are gonna ask you um, if you prepare you, you know, like they're gonna ask you why this court, why them, um, what do you wanna do after your clerkship? You know, why do you wanna, like, so a lot of the questions are very, um, you are, you know. And I think that another thing for my single interview, I also interviewed with the, the magistrate judge had a permanent law clerk. So I had to interview with the, it wasn't a, called an interview, but I had a discussion with the law clerk as well to see if, if that was a personality match because this was a career, he was a career clerk. I would be in chambers with him. And, you know, that was more laid back. And I remember asking quite more so personality questions like, what do you do for fun? What is it to do in Connecticut? And I knew that um, that would show them that I'm also interested in just the area and like being in chambers with them and not just so like a monotone, like what is the job like? like you know, so I think that you have to really let your personality shine during these interviews because they're really just looking to see, do they like you? <laughs> because Chambers is such a close-knit quarters. Like, can they stand, be around you for 40 hours, 50 hours a week? I think that's the main thing. So going there with confidence that you are qualified, you can do this and just let your personality shine was always the advice I got from Joanne <laughs> was to just to show them your personality. Like you got this. So um, that's like the best thing I can say. <laughs> Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more. And uh, I'll add, uh, you know, be uh, wary of the sort of what you might think would be the oddball question or, uh, you know, the question that allows you to be who you are, you know, be who you are. And, you know, I had an interview with then judge Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, this is 1994, I want to say, and the, everything was going great. She was a district court judge at the time. Everything was going great. We hit it off. And her last question was, so what do you do for fun? Honest, God's honest truth. What do you do for fun? And I was like, humana, humana. I could, you know, what the honest truth at the time was I, you know, followed the Yankees and I used to go to bars in the North Bronx and shoot pool. That's what I did. That was what I did for fun. If she, had, if I had said that, she's a huge Yankee fan and she grew up in the Bronx. 
like I might have you know gotten the clerkship on that answer alone, but I was like ah 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 ah, and I didn't really have a, an answer, and you know it it I did not get the job. I'm I'll, I'll be I'm sad to report. Um, so you know you you might get that sort of question. Certainly the you know who who are you who are you what do you do in your free time. Um, tell me about your family, you know, like they want to get to know who you are uh, because, you know, as Alicia said, like you're going to be in chambers with them and they want to, you know, they're not looking for robots who, uh, who are just going to come in and, and, you know, grind out opinions. They, they're looking for a member of the team. Um, and so that matters. Um, the other thing to know, if you are fortunate enough to get an interview, there is a you know a good chance that you know if you don't you know mess up the interview no pressure uh that you will get the you know that you're you're you know serious candidate they don't offer the jobs to they don't offer interviews to a lot of people if you get an offer from a judge you are generally expected to accept it so if you are going to apply to any judge you should be ready if they interview you to you know to accept an offer if they make it to you particularly in the federal system particularly if you're an appellate judge it's you know uh, it's not like oh thanks that's really great when can i get back to you because i'm you know thinking about a couple of other things that's not how it works in the clerkship business uh dean fitzpatrick correct me if i'm wrong um uh but I would, you know, if, if you, if you do get an inner, you know, A, only apply to judges where you'd actually work for them. B, you know, when you start getting, if you start getting a callback interview, um, you know, consider seriously whether if, you know, imagine at the end of the interview, the judge says, great, I want you, you know, will you accept? Be ready to accept if uh, if that comes your way, because it's not like not judges like get turned get down, down that often. Uh, Dean Fitzpatrick, do you want to weigh in here? I, I would just agree with that. I mean, I, I've honestly maybe never had a situation where a student came to me and said, I got an offer for a, a federal clerkship and I turned it down. So, so the good news is I think most often when students are going through the rigor of applying for these positions, um, they've already thought about the probability of accepting. Um, the one thing I will say is don't forum shop your, your clerkships, right? Don't, it's not wise to um, use an offer from one judge to negotiate an offer from another. We don't want you to do that and you don't wanna do that. Um, so, general guideline plan to accept the first offer you get from a judge and and in that way plan your application strategically and your interviewing strategically in terms of timing um i with that said i have to excuse myself for a one o'clock appointment so i'm gonna turn the program over to joanne casey to finish out and i just want to say thank you all so much for participating and i i hope our students got as much out of this as i did all right Joanne. Thank you, Dean Fitzpatrick. Does anybody else have any further questions for our panelists today? Well, you just made my job of closing this out very easy. <laughs> if you, anyone, you can follow up with any of us. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure I see heads nodding uh, of the other panelists. Uh, if you don't have our emails, you know, please ask the Career Center. I'm sure any one of us are, are more than happy to, I'll speak only for myself. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about my experiences, about, about the clerkship application process. I, you know, was fortunate. I did a very narrow search. I wasn't going to move out of New York City uh, at the time. I only applied to a small number of judges, uh, it, you know, judges who I agreed with, you know, I you know, agreed with in philosophy and politics. Um, and I was fortunate. If I didn't get one of those judges, I didn't want a clerk. And I was very, very lucky. Um, but, you know, you may have a different approach. Uh, but I'm, I'm uh, personally, I'm happy to talk to any of you. Thank you. And I can, I can definitely tell you that Professor Brescia is an incredible resource. I know I personally, if I have students on the fence about doing clerkships, I send them right over to Professor Brescia. So 
Um, you do have Professor Brescia and other faculty members and all of our panelists here as a resource, um, as well as your career counselors to help you through this process if you have any questions. Yeah. Well, so great to see some of, um, some of you that I haven't seen in a long time. Thank you again for taking the time today. I know Dean Fitzpatrick really appreciated it, and so do all of us. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Take care.